Hello and welcome to Unpacking Mormonism and Other Religious Trauma. I'm your host today, Sarah Westbrook, joined uh, with my husband. He's very sexy. Oh, there he is. Hello, Mason. Howdy. Uh, Mason Westbrook. So we are actually launching today a little bit later than normal. We have had an insane last couple of weeks, but I think that's kind of the, the Westbrook norm. So are you ready to get started, Mason? All right. He gives me he gives me the thumbs up. So really quickly before we get, begin, um, we are very appreciative. We had some donors um, send us some money by clicking here on the Venmo app. Um, donations are greatly appreciated because they do help us pay our production team a livable industry standard wage. And that is very, very important to us. Um, and as we move into the Daisy Girl Wellness Farm, we are going to be getting a larger production team and, and whatnot. So your donations and your generosity help. Although the thing that we love the most is emails expressing your thoughts, opinions, and constructive criticism. Um, we have thoroughly enjoyed engaging with our audience. So thank you so much. And for those of you who joined us, uh, I guess it was about two weeks ago and earned some prizes. Those will be getting shipped out to you hopefully this week. I... Um, I had an unexpected event occur. I was driving in the snow and my Toyota Highlander is no more. Um, gratefully, we're all alive and well, just a little bit banged up. Um, but I'm a little behind on getting those out. So um, if you, you were called out for winning some Daisy Girl merchandise, uh, please know that I am sorry that it's late, but it is on its way to you. All righty. So our show today is our final wrap-up show for our Temple series. So, Mason, what do you think? How do you think we've done on the Temple series? Is there anything you well, wish we had covered or didn't cover, or what are your thoughts? I think we did pretty good. I would be interested to know if others felt the same way, but I think we did pretty good. We wanted to just kind of, um, I mean, we went over some of the history, but mostly we wanted to kind of go over just what happens and then kind of the mental health impact of that I think we've covered that pretty decently and I'm hoping that we'll kind of just wrap all of that up and close that out today as we as we finish up. Yeah. Absolutely. So and I'm going to keep looking over here our producer has to jet early so I'm running the behind the scenes apparently so is Mason. Um <laughs> so I'm trying yeah. to anyway, not very good at it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we we also have heard from our production or from our producer, Alex, who said that our Temple series um, is our fastest high listens of any of the shows that we've done. So we're really shout out to our audience for your support. And I agree, Mason, today's kind of a wrap up. I feel like we we did a lot of the history of it. We did a lot of our experiential um, expertise with it as well. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of fun. I'm also grateful to be wrapping it up. Although I think we didn't do the ceilings, did we? No, we never did oh. do the ceilings. Darn it. All right. So you're going to see this live today as the wrap up. And then we'll go in studio <laughs> to another show later this week to talk about the ceilings. Because I think that that one's really important for our family. So we're doing our wrap up show a day early. And then we'll do the last, the next one, and we'll be wrapped up. Okay, that just tells me how. Yes, we have something to do tomorrow, right? Right, we are so unorganized; it is just gloriously consistent um, <laughs> for the Westbrook Valley. All right, so today in our show, as we wrap up, um, I remember I'm going to go ahead and just jump in with a story because I feel that humans learn best through relatable stories. Um, and I feel that that is just kind of par for the, for the course here, um, especially since as we're wrapping this up and moving into the next project, we'll also be increasing um, the new project, Unpacking with Sarah, um, that is not affiliated with anything religious. We're just going to be talking about trauma and mental health and me mental wellness in general. Um, and I'm really excited about that project. So out with the old and with the new. Um, but my story is that about, so I'm going to look over here because it's just easier for me. About a little less than a year ago. Hang on, my computer hates me. There it goes. Sure, it's there all the it computers. Does. There we go. Oh, this I'll is my happy place. I know. 
I know. Isn't she, doesn't she look just so happy? She's so peaceful. So this is me. Um, obviously I'm not temple worthy in this picture because you can see my shoulders and my armpits. Um, Mason, is that you clapping? What is that sound? Yeah, that was the um, the tick 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 sound, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not temple worthy here, apparently, because I'm showing my shoulders. I'm also in another picture. I'm out with one of my closest friends. Um, this is my dear sweet friend, Steph. Hey, Steph, if you're watching, love you so much. Um, but Stephanie and I went on a cruise um, almost a year ago now. I think it was April that we went. And we were naughty. We drank alcohol. We, you know, ran around in swimsuits. We soaked in the hot tub. We sang karaoke. And it was just the two of us on a cruise. It was a much needed break from our kids. That is why I look so blissfully happy right here is because there are no kids in the cruise ships daycare center waiting for me to come pick them up um and we went to the bahamas we went to grand turk um and we almost sunk actually <laughs> our boat we got hit by a rip wind of from the tornadoes that hit florida i think it was last april um just as we were leaving port and our boat literally tipped and even the staff was a little bit frantic it was it was quite humorous but we all lived we all came home and on the very last night of that cruise i had this experience and a thought so i'm going to show the picture here of um the experience so here we are this is the last night of the cruise and if you were able i don't know if we can zoom in i don't think we can zoom in um so get really really close to your screen and you know with your eyeballs zoom in to this picture and so what you're seeing here is we've got our um cruise director on the stage um they're they're handing out prizes we're doing the last night of the cruise celebration we are going to be porting in long beach california first thing the following morning so we you know people were up all night long enjoying their last night of vacation and he was teaching us a lot of line dances and everybody was dancing together and it's really hard to see in this picture but on this ship i want to say it was the jubilee but i could be wrong on the name of the ship um but there was you know balcony like buttresses all the way up um in the center of this carnival cruise ship and there were people there were there were passengers lined up at the glass barrier like the Oh, goodness, Mace, what am I wanting to call it? Like the banister, the thing, so you don't fall over. That thing. Yeah. The railing. There it is, the glass. The railing. <laughs> the glass railing. Um, I call that the Abbey-proof glass, although Abby would still climb it, which is why Abby's never joined us on a cruise before, because, you know, squirrel. Um, so right. anyway, but all the way up, and I'm going to say like nine stories, eight stories, six stories. Hey, there's my little squirrel. Um, eight or nine stories. I don't remember how big. It was a big, big ass ship for sure. And there were people lined up all the way around, all the way up. And as I just took a moment um, and watched people. So, you know, I'm a mental health counselor. 80% of communication is nonverbal. And so I've gotten really good at, at reading people's nonverbal communication in the sense of like, I'm not clairvoyant. I definitely do not possess that skill at all. Um, if I tried to be a clairvoyant, that would be a disaster and a half. Um, but anyway, as I, I remember as I was standing there watching all of these people and looking around, there were some interesting things that I saw. Um, and, and what I saw was a great deal of joy a great deal of celebration. I saw young ladies dancing with older men, um, older women dancing with younger men, you know, people just having a great time, people loving and talking and engaging with complete strangers. And it reminded me, like this thought came into my head as I was experiencing this very joyous occasion on the very last night of this vacation that I took with my girlfriend. And um, the thought was, this is what my Mormon upbringing would have identified as the great and spacious building. And so, Mason, as you're pulling out your scriptures there, I'm going to put in our great and spacious building picture. So if you are familiar at all with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. Mormons, teachings, the great and spacious building is part of the... Uh, let's see, it's Lehi's dream. And then Nephi goes out and is like, hey, God, I need help understanding this because my dad 
couldn't explain it good enough for me and I'm a dumb shit. So I needed it to be explained a second time. Yes, there's a little bit of sass in there. Um, but the idea of the great and spacious building is that the great and spacious building was representative of this world and all of the people living in sin thinking that they were going to um thinking that they were happy but being wrong about it hello latter daily digest it's great to see you um i believe that's gene hello gene and maven uh really excited to see that you're going for a walk with us today so anyway the great and spacious building um is supposed to represent people who think they're happy and having a great time but they're really not as happy as the people over here in the picture with the shiny fruit, which is representative representative of the tree of life. That's supposed to be representative of like heaven and happiness. And that all of these people in this great and spacious building are laughing at the people who are doing their best to live a good life, to be with God and Jesus again, to be with their families forever. And that their laughter was, I mean, I remember Mason in the pictures that I would have seen growing up, it would have been like people who were drunk, people who were falling all over themselves. Um, people well, in scantily clad humans. Go ahead, Mason. What were you saying? I'm, you have to have alcohol to have a good time. So yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, well, Mormons tend to think that non-Mormons can't have fun without alcohol because we have to like numb our brains or I don't know. Anyway, I'm making right. a lot of assumptions here and I don't I don't necessarily want to do that. But I remember being on that cruise ship and saying this is what Mormonism used to define as the great and spacious building. And in fact, um, Steph and I met a family as we were um, in line to get on the boat. So we were in Orlando, Florida. We were in line to get on the boat. Um, and there was another family, you know, a couple people ahead of us or whatever. And they had a bunch of little kids and, and whatnot. And I was listening to them talk. And of course, if you're Mormon, if those of you have ever been Mormon, like Mason and I have been Mormon, like we wear that I'm a Mormon badge. Well, we don't say that anymore, I guess. Um, but we, we wear the I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints badge of pride on our shoulder and so of course as we're standing in line we see this family and they're like oh yeah we're like from the church's great letter saints blah, 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 blah. so anyway we kind of bumped into this family off and on on the cruise ship and while i was standing here i'm gonna add this one while i was standing here watching people so you have to understand it's a cruise ship okay so there are absolutely people on that dance floor in bikinis and bathing suits or swimsuit cover-ups definitely some tank tops definitely some alcohol lots of loud music lots of loud laughter that was one of the promises we made in the temple um, that we wouldn't laugh very loud i guess i'm not necessarily certain what that meant and as this LDS family with their kids were going through, they were rushing them. It was like they were rushing their little kids, like little mama ducks hurting their little ducks along the way. And it was like, hurry, hurry, hurry. We don't want to be a part of this. This The spirit's not here. And I remember hearing that from, I think it was mom or the dad. I don't even remember, you know, this like the spirit isn't here. So we got to hurry through this. We don't want to be like all these other people. And it struck me as very ironic. And so I wanna come back to that thought here in a minute. Um, so Mason, do you have anything you wanna add before we jump ahead? I just hang on to that thought. <coughs> uh, no, go ahead. I, I've got a couple ideas, but I think you can just continue and- Okay, so Mason wants me to finish. Up. Yeah, Mason wants me to finish. Hi, Virginia, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and so the next picture is this one right here. In Mormonism, in my Mormon upbringing, I was taught that this ginormous building was the closest to heaven I could get while on this earth. Um, that it was supposed to be very peaceful, that all of the questions that I had for a higher power could be answered in these walls and that I was supposed to attend often. Um, in contrast to the cruise ship, most everything that goes on in the temple, unless it's my uh, mom's side of the family welcoming me, me through the veil after my wedding day, um, where everybody was shushing us because we we wheelies, and in my book, I called them the Thomases. Um, we are a loud group of human beings. Um, and so anyway, um, 
everything is in, in hushed tones. And yet I don't feel like I, I never had a feeling of great peace um, or answers. Um, for me, this place was always very boring, very ritualistic and very, very ornate. And one of the things that struck me as I watched this and sing along, by the way, I mean, we were doing a lot of party theme dances, like we did the YMCA, we did the electric slide, like we were having a good time. Um, and so as I watched this from above and was dancing and singing along, kind of tapping to the beat and enjoying the scene. And I, you know, see this cute little family um, hurting their little children like ducks, hoping to protect them from all the evilness of this joyous occasion. The thought that came to me was, if this is the great and spacious building, I would much rather be here than here. Any given day of the week, because while I was here, so for those of you that are just listening, I'm talking about the um, cruise ship right now. In the cruise ship, I was able to walk around in a bathing suit. I do not have a perfect body, okay? This body has birthed a few children, and I thoroughly enjoy brownies, and the bikini industry does not get to have power over me. I do not need to have a perfect body, and nobody judged me. Nobody commented on my skin color. About the only comment I had on that entire ship about my body had to do with, ooh, honey, you're really white, and you're turning red too fast. You need some sunblock? I think that was about the only... Um, comment I got about my body was somebody trying to protect me from the sun eating me alive, which I was very appreciative for. Um, this was a ship full of significant diversity. There were several groups of uh, patrons on that ship that English was not their primary language. Um, we saw people from many different walks of lives. And here we are in the center having a great time connecting over something we have in common. And while I know that there were people on that ship that were probably judging other people, the vast majority of us were there to have fun and just embrace the beauty of exploring the earth and connecting over pop culture and um, musical awareness. Like I think my favorite scene, and I'm trying to see if it's in this picture, there was this cute little girl probably about the same age as my Abigail is now, like probably between 10 and 12 years old who was trying to teach the grandma how to do the chicken dance. And it was probably the cutest thing I've ever seen. Um, I've never seen that type of joy and fun and happiness and connection at the Mormon temple in all of my life. And I've been Mormon, was Mormon from birth until I was in my mid to late 30s. And so it makes me wonder, is this Salt Lake City Temple and the other, I don't even know how many temples we're at now, the great and spacious building, or is it truly heaven on earth? Um, and I'll let you decide. So Mason, your turn. What do you think? Well, just a couple thoughts for you. Of course, I know people are thinking, <clears throat> yeah, but that's not my experience. And that's fair, right? Like we everybody has a different experience and some people have felt more peace and love in the temple than they felt anywhere else. And, and that's, that's fine. I, I know that's the case for a lot of people. And I think that's great. One of the things that you mentioned, you know, in order to separate the tree of life and the great and spacious building or the temple and the great and spacious building, there's a lot of judgment going on. There's separation. There's um, making other populations or people lesser. There's assumptions about those people. And I don't think that that breeds love. I don't think it breeds understanding. I don't think it breeds a desire to be together with what Mormons would call our brothers and sisters. Uh, and whereas on, on the Carnival Cruise, there may have been some judgment. I'm sure there was. Uh, it was there were people there. There was going right. to be some judgment. There's always yeah. going to be some judgment. But it was... It was an inward judgment. You know, it's there's less of the outward judgment of basically what it is, is one of the things I wrote down is that moral superiority loosens tongues. 
And so what I feel like happens a lot in Mormonism and other religious cultures is that because we feel like we have the moral high ground, we feel like we can say whatever we think is appropriate. And so there's a lot of judgment going on, whereas in this experience with you, you didn't feel that. Whereas in the temple, you did feel that. And, and I think that's important to, to recognize. Yeah. Uh, part of it also, the big piece of the whole judgment thing is that in Mormonism, there's always a dynamic of power. If someone is judging you, either they have power over you, quote unquote, from, from the church, from the religious system, or they're connected to someone that has power over you, or they can tell someone that has power over you what's going on. Like there's a system of narking almost. And it doesn't- Wait, when you say, pause, when you say narking, do you mean like I'm tattletelling? Is that what you yes. mean? Okay, yes. keep going. Yeah, there's, there's like a setup of tattletelling, almost expected kind of a thing. Um, and it's all done, well, it's not all done. It It's often, emphasized in the name of, well, we're just trying to help you be better. We're trying to take care of you, but it doesn't often feel that way. Um, it, 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 for me, like, as I watched this mother hurt her children through this group of people, warning them that danger was like lurking in the main area of the <laughs> ship. Um, for me, it was how sad because those children are not allowed to just watch and see the goodness in humanity and how people across cultures and language barriers and, and whatnot were able to connect together. Because, I mean, I don't know how many passengers fit on that boat. Um, I'm going to say there were definitely more than, I think, 5,000. I think, I, I'm going to have to look it up um, to see just what, what ship it was, because I don't remember what ship it was, um, but how many passengers are on there. But we'll just say, yeah. even if it's just 2,000 people, um, on that boat from different walks of life, instead of these children being able to see something absolutely beautiful, like it doesn't matter what you're wearing, it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter what language you speak or what color your skin is, you can find joy in celebrating or celebration and connection through the things that you have in, in common with each other. And those kids missed that, as did the parents. As did the parents, the whole family missed the beauty of, of people connecting over pop culture. Yeah, well, and if I can harken back to the bite model, which is one of the things I went back over today, at least parts of it, mm -hmm. the very last number on the bite model, so you're in section four, emotional control number eight, which is the last number, the first thing it says is phobia indoctrination. In other words, the creation and indoctrination of fears. And if I could make assumptions, and, and I don't want to judge this family, but it looks like you're afraid of maybe your kids seeing a bikini. You're afraid of seeing people have fun while they're drinking. You're afraid of seeing alcohol. You know, these kinds of things, like instead of creating a healthy understanding of things like dancing, things like drinking, things like having fun, like you can walk your kids through there and go back to your room and say, hey, can we sit and chat about what we just saw? I just want you guys to know that there's nothing to be afraid of here. But these are the things that we're concerned about. Like you can have a healthy conversation about it. If you if you don't want to drink alcohol, there's there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't want your kids to drink alcohol, there's nothing wrong with that. But I felt like what happened for me and what I've seen for so many people is there's just a fear created of those things because they're connected to salvation. Um, the number or the letter B under this one is that cults create terrible consequences if you leave. Hell, possession, incurable diseases, accidents, suicide, blah, blah, blah. Your salvation is owned by the organization. And we have certainly seen that as we've gone through the temple series here. We've seen how that is so very much reality. The temple holds your salvation in its symbols, in its tokens, in its admission, uh, in its exclusions. All of that is tied to your salvation. And, and I think that's really where the danger there is. It's not, you know, can people go to the temple and have an incredibly spiritual experience? Absolutely. I, I know people have. I know people have also claimed to do that, maybe because they were just afraid to say that they didn't. 
but right. some people have a very spiritual experience and there's i think that's great i would simply ask when you come out of the temple after having that spiritual experience take a step back and examine these things that are a part of the bite model and examine to see if you've allowed yourself to be separated from the people around you because of a feeling of superiority because you believe that you have done all the things that you need to do for your salvation does it separate you and cause a superiority over a superiority over other people and if it doesn't then great you know that's terrific but if it does that's a moment for us to reflect and say well what's going on here i know it did for me and at the time i would never have noticed it i i don't even know if i would have acknowledged it but looking back now from a different lens i totally see that it was all about the temple it was all about having those ordinances and that caused a superiority and a separation from the people around me except the ones who were doing the same thing i was doing right well and i'm gonna say something they say i agree with most of what you said but there was a little thing in there where i was like hey i think your mormon shadow is showing up there but i wanted to answer shannon's question number one hey shannon great to see you here thanks so much for joining us um drinking is contracted to salvation um in mormon culture or religion so i think you're asking is drinking um connected to your salvation so in in mormonism drinking alcohol is um against the rules because of the word of wisdom and so if you're drinking alcohol um then you're not worthy in god's eyes that's one of the sins that will absolutely keep you out of the temple connected drinking is connected yes drinking is connected to salvation if you are <laughs> drinking alcohol in the mormon religion on a regular basis or if you have that you know addiction or alcoholism um, then your eternal salvation and your ability to live with God is threatened. It doesn't matter if you're a social drinker or if it's, you know, an occasional glass of wine. Like, the limits don't seem to really matter uh, um, in Mormonism. It's kind of one of those black and white thinking. And it's actually pretty funny uh, story, Mason, from us is that when I was like, hey, I want to try my first drink, um, like, Mason, I think you were kind of convinced that if I had just one or two drinks of alcohol, I was going to become a raging alcoholic and destroy our entire family. Like, his, it, lo your level of anxiety was, today, I'm going to say, quite endearing and, in the moment, infuriating. So, what do you think? I was not convinced you were going to become an alcoholic. I was afraid that you would. And, okay. and I think that's what that is all about. Like if you're breeding these phobias, you're indoctrinating people with the phobia. If you have one drink, you're going to become an alcoholic. Maybe for some people that's true. I'm sure there's documented cases of that. But for yeah. the most part, that's not the case. For the most yeah, part. There, and, is, there is a genetic link through that. We, we see it show up. Sure. But it's. It's sure. not and as common as we used to think that it was. And I love this, Shannon. You said good choice of words, Mason. He's really good with his words. I, and I just <laughs> think, like, I wasn't, I didn't think you were going to become an alcoholic. I didn't right. think, like, I, I have an academic understanding of the fact that if you take a drink of alcohol, you've had a drink of alcohol. I know you. It's not like you're going to change in one moment because you've had alcohol. That's just not the case. Right, but the um, fear was there. The fear was there. The and, fear was there. Right, and I kind of felt like you didn't really know what to do with the fact that the fear that the fear was there. You know, I remember the first time I I drank to a point where you or I would have noticed any psycho alterations in me was when I had burned my hand on the stove. And I was like, I won't take narcotics, but I'm going to try a shot of whiskey. And I was then able to tolerate the pain in my nerve endings, which, I mean, makes sense. Back in, you know, the pioneer days, the rough and rugged United States, whatever. Right. We drank whiskey as a pain medicine. Um, and, I mean, you have the story of Joseph Smith. Like, oh, I can't drink that whiskey for my leg. And then glorifying it when... You know, I drank a shot of whiskey and I was a much nicer person because the whole palm of my hand, which I had just seared off um, being stupid and careless in the kitchen. Yeah. Right. Like within I, within reason, there's a time and a place. So, I, yeah, I do. I do anesthesia. Like how many people <laughs> how many people would not be able to get whatever's going on for them? How many people would not be able to get it fixed? because they couldn't tolerate the procedure without right. the drugs that I provide. Are, are they addictive? Some of them are. Are oh, they definitely. poison? Some of them are. 
Like they're they're a big deal and have cannot like they can be abused. And so we're careful with them, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have them in order to be comfortable during a procedure that is life saving or certainly life preserving or quality of life preserving all those things. Right. It, again, it just comes down to the fear. If we can't have a healthy conversation about it, then mm -hmm. it, it, we just create fear. Like I know that's the case for me. Like I wasn't able to have a healthy conversation about alcohol. Why not? I had no idea what it was like. I didn't have any experience with it. Nobody in my family had ever been an alcoholic that I was aware of. Right. And so there was no healthy discussion to go on. It was it was just don't do it. God said don't, so don't. Like it's as simple as that. Like God laid down the law, we follow the law. And I just I just don't think that that's very healthy in that in a lot of situations, maybe most situations, I just don't think that that's very healthy. Yeah, absolutely. So, hey, Stephanie, thanks so much for the heart um, that you've given us. One of the greatest things that our audience can do is like and subscribe. It helps bump us up in the algorithms so that our show is able to reach more people. So please do that. And then, of course, um, we want to I want to make sure, you know, yes, I am an LPC. Addiction is super complex and that's not our topic today. Um, but yeah, addiction is super complex. And when I started drinking, I actually did it on a cruise ship with one of my best friends. Um, or she shows up in my book as Finn. And I, I mean, I went there to be like, Hey, I want to know what this feels like. I want to taste this. I want to figure out what I like, what I don't like, if I even like it in a very safe environment. And so when you're approaching those things in a responsible way, that's a good thing. But Mason, I wanted to challenge something that you had said about, you know, this mama ushering her little ducklings through the crowd of the cruise ship with the spirits not here kind of like what you were saying you know let's let's instill fear about something that is very human and beautiful versus you know this religious dogma of if i look in the wrong direction uh for too long i'm going my children are going to be at risk for being contaminated by the world and i think that you know when you said mason something along so i heard you say let me let me use my gottman skills what I heard you say was, you know, you can have these conversations, take them into the room and then have them judge in private. Um, that's what I heard you say. That's not what you said, but you said, you know, we can have those healthy conversations. We can talk to her because, you know, did you see this? We didn't like that. And I would say, you know, from from my perspective, um, as if if you were a client and saying, hey, how do I teach my children the standards um, that we have and, and you know, the, this level of morality for our family? I would say, hey, kiddos, what did you think of that big party? You know, did you like the music? Was it loud? Did you like the dancing? What did you like? What didn't you like? And if my children identified something that made them uncomfortable, then I would talk about it. But I'm not going to walk my kids through a crowd and be like, oh, did you see that person who was? Because we don't want to do that. Because when we when we teach our kiddos that way, we're actually teaching them to judge. And you'd be surprised. Most kids are pretty oblivious to the things that make their parents uncomfortable. And so one of the ways to protect your children from fear is if they're in a situation that is not dangerous to them, you don't need to say, hey, you're three years old and we walked through that and that was bad and and, and you could have lost the spirit of God and you, you just don't want to do that because then your three-year-old's like, I don't even know what it was now. I'm going to lose God, right? So right. like recognize the ages and stages that your kiddos are at. If one of your kiddos is to say something like, you know, hey, mommy, that man was stumbling around and he fell down and it really scared me because he bonked his head. Well, then that's a great time to have the conversation of, you know, alcohol can be used for good things and it can be overused and, and cause somebody to really struggle in their life. So when you're grown up and old enough, you know, for me, for our family, we chose not, we, we've chosen not to drink because we feel like that's a dangerous thing, you know, but if you make a different decision, just remember a little bit's okay, a lot can really change the way that you interact in life. But there's no reason to take your kids into the back bedroom and start checking all the boxes off of what the entire, you know, passenger list, the roster, what is it called? The manifest. Thank you. The passenger manifest. We don't need to go through and, and make sure that our three-year-old and our six-year-old and our 10-year-old are aware of all of the evils of the passengers on the manifest. For one, you're taking away the joy of their vacation. Number yeah. two, you're, you end up inadvertently creating an anxious response when 
most of our kids are just not aware of that. Like if you ask Kate, so Katie joined me on a cruise a couple years ago. And if you ask her what she loved about the cruise, that girl spent the entire time getting crispy bacon, sunburn all along her back because she would not get out of the fucking swimming pool. And she had a glorious time doing it. And she told me I was boring because at three o'clock in the afternoon, I was like, I'm going to go take a nap so we can watch the nighttime shows tonight. She's like, you're boring. I'm staying in the pool. And I was like, great. Have have at it, kid. That that kid also, she would have been what? She's should have been about 12, 13, 14. The first time that she went on a cruise, I think she's about 14. Uh, yeah. The first time that she went on a cruise with me. And even at 14, she was not aware of the dangers on the ship. And, you know, for me, it was, hey, don't just make sure you're always in the public areas. Make sure you stay with your buddy. She met a little friend there. And it was make sure you stay with your buddy and you're not allowed to go in anybody's room but ours. And so we set those healthy boundaries to keep her safe. And then I let her explore. And for her, it's a wonderful memory. And she's not even going to be aware of just how drunk some of the people were around her because she's oblivious. Um, yeah. Does the religion teach God said not to drink? Um, Mace, I'm going to hand that one over to you from Shannon. Does Mormonism say that God said not to drink? I don't know. Well, let me read from you from the first section of the Doctrine and Covenants right here when it says, Search these commandments for they are true and faithful and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken. I excuse not myself. And then right down at the bottom, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Does Mormonism teach that God said not to drink? In not so many words, yeah, the word of wisdom is supposedly coming from God. If you look at the beginning of the word of wisdom, it's spoken as if it's coming from Jesus. Right. And the standard there is to abstain from alcohol. And whether or not that's what was intended initially by Joseph Smith, it is absolutely what it is now. When you're talking about your Temple Recommend interview, it isn't, are you careful with things that are in the word of wisdom? It's, do you obey the word of wisdom by abstaining right. from these things and alcohol is one of them so maybe not so much in a black and white thing but absolutely that's what's implied well and i think what's so interesting about that is let's point out the hypocrisy there you know when the word of wisdom came about it was a suggestion it was a word of wisdom it was um said with the intent of you know limit these things but it didn't actually change anybody's behavior including the prophet who claimed to have gotten it because if you are aware of the history of Joseph Smith, he ordered up a bottle of wine, a very expensive bottle of wine, <coughs> uh, to his room at the Liberty Jail. Now, I didn't even know you could order your own alcohol in jail. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, the world has changed when I was working um, at the local sheriff's office here as the mental health um, person. We definitely were not allowing prisoners to order up alcohol um i think you were allowed to say i'm gluten free and they would bring you gluten free food um but as far as getting alcohol in jail that was um yeah not allowed and yet joseph smith was drinking with um hiram smith john taylor and shit mace what was the other guy's name that was in there with them willard richards thank you willard richards i wanted to say wilford woodruff and i was like it's not wilford willard yeah. richards i was close it's the damn w's Willard, so, Wilford, Westbrook, confusion. Squirrel. So one squirrel. final comment on that. You're, you're absolutely right. It's in verse one. I'm sorry, verse two of the word of wisdom, which is section 89 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where it says to be sent greeting, not by commandment or constraint, but by revelation and the word of wisdom. Uh, like it's right in the revelation that it's not a commandment. It's not constraint, but it's, it, again, the, the bite model, right? You take things that are meant to be um, liberating. They're meant to help you be a better person. And then you make them a rule in order to control that person. So we offered you liberty, but actually what we're going to do is we're going to take that from you. Um, but right. then and I love back. this that Ellen says the rule change to drink wine of your own making after the um, extermination order. So it was okay to drink it. Um Locals used the wine as a method of poisoning members as part of the extermination order. I'm not familiar with that second part, Ellen. I'm not saying it's not true. I just don't, I would love to see that. Um, please email me a link to that. I'd love to learn more about that. But yes, the, the rules changed quite 
quite substantially um, over well, over the years. And I think that that's part of the part of the confusion um, with a lot of the teachings of Mormonism is that, you know, you start out with something. So bringing us back to like this idea of what's the great and spacious building, you know, from the time you're little kids. I mean, Mason, when did you start learning about the great and spacious building? Like when oh, was the first I, time you I'm think sure. you heard it? It could have been as early as a year and a half old when I went to nursery where they started talking about like the tree of life or whatever. I, it, it could have been that early. It certainly was by the time I was three or four in primary. I'm absolutely certain we had lessons about the great and spacious building. Yeah. So. I, and I would agree with that. I think that that's, you know, when I would start and it was, oh, my goodness, I don't want to be of the world. I've got to be in the world, but not of the world, meaning I'm going to live in the world, but I'm not going to participate in the worldly things such as line dancing with old people with a little bit of alcohol in their systems on a rocking cruise ship because we did cruise during hurricane season, not going to lie. Um, and we took off out of Orlando. So the boat was very, very rocky in <laughs> April. Um, and so, you know, we were having a great time. We were connecting. And this, when I was in my Mormon years, I would have judged as dangerous, evil. I would have been very uncomfortable. I would have thought that um, something was going to, you know, like there was some some contagion in there and that if I caught that, I would end up um, tarnished and tainted and I would definitely need to repent of something, which would have just been a huge, like I would have been anxious all the time while on vacation. So a time where I'm supposed to be relaxing and, and enjoying myself with or without alcohol, with or without the other passengers on the boat, I would have been constantly <clears throat> afraid. And really what my experience has been over my years in Mormonism is that the people who have judged me the most harshly, the people who have made fun of me, the people who say, claim that I'm stupid, the people who are actually fitting the description of that great and spacious building have an all-inclusive pass to this one. Yeah, well, and to bring it back to this, this building here, I think really the, the problem is this creates the ultimate in black and white thinking. When you walk out of this temple, you believe that you know exactly what you need to know to go back to God. And that is painted in black and white. And so anything that would keep you out of that building, anything that would keep you from following the covenants or whatever that you make in the temple, that's all bad. It's not just, it's not just impermissible. Like, like you could walk out of the temple and say, you know what? There's nothing wrong with alcohol, but it's not permitted for me. I'm choosing to stay away from it because of this. But ultimately what happens is judgment. Alcohol is bad because it's restricted. So if it's restricted for me to get into the temple, it's bad. And so there's right. this huge black and white differential and it creates that separation and it creates that immediate judgment. If ever you see somebody with, with alcohol, with a cigarette that are chewing tobacco, that have tattoos, that have coffee, that have too many you can piercings. see their shoulders, sir. Right. They have a they have a nose piercing. They don't have shoulders. They have you shorts see that are too short. They like, don't have shoulders. Did you just say they don't have shoulders? Clothing. As in they're like their clothing doesn't they're, have shoulders. You have no shoulders but arms. You're like a T Rex. <laughs> yes. Thank you for stalling my my progress there Squirrel. for something like Squirrel. that. Sorry. <laughs> They don't, but you anyway, can't be on a soapbox, only I'm allowed to be on a soapbox. I've just, but I've just named several things that are easy and immediate judgments that if you've been through the temple, we all make them. And whether or not, like some people I know make those we judgments it, and don't care about it. Right. Can I call it something, Mason, and then let you finish? Yeah. I, I already interrupted you. So I guess that means yes. I'm sorry. I'm being bossy. Like you need permission to interrupt me. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. It's, I'm going to call it benevolent judgment. I'm judging the fact that your shoulders or your midriff are showing in order to protect my own sanctity and that of my children because I got to instill this fear in order to stop my children from showing their shoulders or their midriff or from drinking, you know, Satan's brew that comes from Starbucks or all these other things. And then we also ignore all the, the other pieces, but... Yeah. It's funny that you say that. We also ignore the other pieces. This last comment by Shannon here. What does the church say about them drinking? How do they excuse it? We don't talk about that stuff. 
like the way that they ex the way that they explain it is by not explaining it. We don't talk about it. Like you don't get taught that Joseph Smith drank wine in the prison. Oh yes. You have to find that out from other sources that are not quote unquote trustworthy sources, even though it's absolutely true. Like we explain it by not explaining it. We don't talk about that stuff. Right. I think that if you went to a primary meeting, so in a Mormon meeting, um, primary is going to be your kiddos that are three years old to 11 years old. So, um, and what, what you're going to say, if you said, does, jo did Joseph Smith drink alcohol? I can almost guarantee you none of those kids are going to be like, yes, he did. The night he died, the day Joseph Smith right. got murdered, he had some yummy wine. And frankly, right. I'm like, dude, if you can get wine in jail, okay. Yeah. I, I mean, you obviously are not in a very, you know, strict yeah. jail. I, I mean, <laughs> have a glass, you know, kick your feet up, take the anxiety off for what's going to, whatever's going to happen to you tomorrow. Wonderful, if I, I guess. I mean, like I said, I wouldn't fly in the United States anymore. But my guess is that most of those children would not know. Most of the youth wouldn't know. And I mean, if I said that, Mason, even to your parents who have been members or my parents, like I don't think even my parents would know that Joseph Smith drank and smoked cigars all the way, even after the revelation. And frankly, if God came to me and said, don't do this, it's so bad for your body and it's going to make it harder for you to have me in your life. I'd probably stop. I mean, I think that's it's, kind of one of those like wow experiences. It's funny uh, we like to it's funny we like to tell the story about how did the word of wisdom come about? Well, all the elders were in there and they were spitting their tobacco and smoking and Emma said, I'm not cleaning up after this anymore. And my first thought now from this side of things is Joseph Smith never cared what Emma thought. I mean, Joseph Smith has lived his life like someone who didn't care what Emma thought. And Joseph Smith lived his life not caring what anybody thought unless to, he could get money from them. Well, yeah, to some degree. And the ones that disagreed with him vehemently enough and usually and sometimes they didn't even have to do it vehemently. They got he the boot, right. They were right. out. He's right. like, oh, you're evil. Get out. Yeah. Right. So Joseph Smith never lived the word of wisdom. And that I mean, again, we're we're harping on the word of wisdom. This is not right, part right. of the temple. Aside really from the fun. fact that it's an admission requirement. Right. And, and so, and for me, and to kind of just lead it to that kind of closing up thing for you is that it creates this black and white thing. The temple is a separator, not a unifier. Right. It's excluder rather than inclusion. And, and not that I mean you can't have a building where you require people to live a certain way in order to enter. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with right. that. I would actually say we need to protect that right as part of our religious freedoms in this sure. country. Sure. Um, if they want to do that, that's fine. Right. The, they the do problem that, that's fine. is the problem is it's it's in the name of creating better quote unquote Christians, but I don't feel like that's what's actually happening when they come out of the temple. Unless they just can open their minds to the fact that this is going on. They don't become better Christians because of the temple. The temple kind of sets you up to be a less Christian rather than more Christian. Right. Absolutely. Thanks, Mason. I would say that I would rather be, okay, I'm going to pull out my pictures again, back on this cruise ship, line dancing with those who are mildly tipsy on a tippy boat, on a tipsy boat any day than back in this temple um, of the Mormon church for Sarah Westbrook. And I can only speak for Sarah. Um, the temple never <laughs> brought me happiness or peace. Um, it always was uncomfortable for me. And I know that's not the case for everybody. I would say that if you as an individual can attend um, any temple or any building and feel closer to your higher power, feel like you are connecting, um, gaining spiritual insight or spiritual growth, then by all means, please go. Sarah's happy place is going to be right here. <laughs> On her way to paradise, I absolutely love exploring the world. And my happy place is actually participating in cultures across the world, um, learning about different climates and different people and, and how they view the world and 
and um, anthropological history. I absolutely love it. Um, I think my favorite thing from this cruise was being kid free with my dear sweet friend, Stephanie. I'll show her here again. Um, we had an absolute blast uh, leaving our children with our husbands. Both of our husbands took leave from work so that she and I could go out and have a kid-free weekend and connect and relax and recuperate. We put water in our very empty wells so that our children can live a long and healthy life because both of us were on the verge of spending a day at Liberty Jail ordering wine before getting murdered. Um, <laughs> strangling or committing, our little baby. Or committing murder, yeah. <laughs> and we're committing murder. <laughs> no, um, yes, it, it, we're all, all in jest here, but this was our, you know, self-care mommy break. And so shout out to our husbands who made that possible. And please, I would encourage our listeners, one of the best things that you can do for your mental health is self-care. Um, I will tell you right now that I'm a hypocrite in this, that I will get completely burned out and at the point of, oh my goodness, Mason, I cannot handle anything else um, before I will rest into self-care. Um, so do as I say, not as I do. This is the Berenstein Bears book about uh, the daddy bear teaching brother bear how to ride the bike. Um, <laughs> And, and that is please take care of your mental health if you need somebody to talk to. Um, you can always reach us. I will have those banners here go. Scroll across the bottom of the screen. And of course, as always, if you are in crisis or you feel like um, you just really need somebody to talk to, you can reach out to us or you can call or text the Mental Health Crisis Hotline at 988. Um, they, these are great resources. Please, by all means, use them. So, Mason, I'm going to go ahead and let you completely close us out, say your thought, and then um, say our goodbyes as I run the board in the back. And thank you so much to our listeners. We forgot, Mason, before you go, we completely forgot to do the Temple Seer, uh, Ceiling um, episode. That is probably because I was in that horrific car accident and it just threw me off and I lost track of where I was at. Um, so we will go ahead and today's our wrap up and then we'll give you a, you know, the bonus episode and then I'll have Alex get those timelines corrected when we release these, um, as a podcast so that you can hear the stories that we have to share about being sealed in the temple and, and my wedding day. So, all right, Mason, go ahead take us away. All right. Just two quick things here. First, I don't think it's fair to call someone hypocritical because they don't do something well. Like just because you know that mental health is, or that taking a break or filling your own well, mental health, you know, preserving your own mental health is important, doesn't mean that life circumstances make it easy. And, and so I would, I would caution you from, from anyone from calling yourself a hypocrite because you're not able to do exactly what you, you know is best for you. And then secondly, thank you guys so much for all of you that have been here and made comments. If I'm understanding correctly, Alex said that these are the first, these have been the quickest episodes to at least 100 views. And I, I love that. Thank you for supporting us. And I hope that the information has been helpful. I hope that it is especially helpful to your own mental health to be able to categorize the idea of the temple appropriately for where you are. It can be very valuable for some people, the temple can. And for other people, it's important to recognize the temple can be very, very damaging. And I think that being able to see it both ways is what really is important. I can enjoy I can enjoy the temple while still recognizing that this is not the right place for everybody. And I can I can sit outside Mormonism and say that is definitely not the right place for me anymore. But I can understand that it is still the right place for someone else. And that's OK. So, so Mason, thank real you guys quick, for being here. hang on, hang on real quick. Alex wanted me to let y'all know it was the fastest to reach 100 listens, but those numbers are still climbing much more rapidly nice. than any other series that we've done before. And we couldn't have yeah, done that thanks without for the clarification. our listeners. Also, awesome. just a reminder, we often throw out prizes during these shows. We did not today. And for those of you that won your prize uh, at our last show, I will get those shipped out. Um, literally, we had a horrible snowstorm and i totaled my highlander and our life got paused there for a minute so we are back at it and we've got a lot of extra time this week because mason's on vacation so woohoo go mason so we'll get those prizes out and we will get you that last episode all right mace back to you 
Oh, that's it. I'm done. Love you guys. Thanks for supporting us and thanks for being here with us. All right. Bye. Thanks, Alex.